Hello and welcome to another edition of Meet the Solutionaries on GreenTV.com. I have a great solutionary story for you today. I am very excited. I'll just cut to the chase to introduce someone I just learned about. And um, his name is Curtis Shuck, and he is with a foundation called Well Done. And when you hear the meaning of well done, definitely a double entendre, and I like puns and all that. You'll be, well, maybe <laughs> you can see from the background, get, get a sense of what we're going to be talking about capping wells. And I learned about this from my green friend, my partner in grime, going back uh, two, three decades, Diane McEachern. Um, she's actually been at the environmental consumer thing even longer than I have. And I got something in honor of her 70th birthday. I guess it's not a secret that she was um, <laughs> trying to do something because uh, it was on Facebook. Can't be a secret. Big, big 7-0 birthday uh, to do something that would be good for the planet and in, in keeping with her values and uh, something that would be lasting. And she said, uh, would you please um, take a look at this? Um, this is something that is a carbon offset or can be for anyone who makes a donation. And went on to explain that this is all about capping oil leaks and mostly methane leaking, which is a big problem. Anyone who knows, uh, well, who watches Green TV knows methane is even more potent, not as long lasting as um, CO2, but more potent, 84 times more potent, I believe. Uh, so this is a big deal idea, but they need to raise a lot of money to cap a well. And I thought, wow, $30,000, does it really cost that much? Would have thought maybe, you know, 3,000 perhaps. So I said, let me let me talk to the, the person behind this, this great idea and ask all my questions. So thanks so much for joining, especially on short notice, Curtis. Oh, thank you, Betsy. It's great to great to be here and and uh, and be in front of you and your viewers. Well, tell us uh, briefly about your background in the oil industry. Sure, and and thanks again for the opportunity. You know, I uh, I grew up in Alaska, and uh, so you know, spent uh, you know in the nineteen seventies, uh, you know, sort of at the uh, the height, if you would, of the Alaska North Slope uh, boom and activity, and um, you know. Grew up very engaged in winter sports and and you know uh, around uh, all of those things that uh, that you envision Alaska is glaciers and and uh, wonderful activities and so I took my first oil and gas job in the summer of 1982 uh, where on the Alaska North Slope where I was working about 50 miles north of the Brooks Range um, just south of Prudhoe Bay and very you know as you can imagine very. Uh, you know, it was the thing and it was going off. And for me, it was an exciting opportunity to be exposed to the industry. And from there, uh, I pursued a career path in, in the uh, oil and gas uh, supply chain uh, side of the house, which was mostly around refined products, did a lot of work in the Northwest seaports. And, um, and then in uh, 2012, started an outreach program from the uh, uh, port of uh, Vancouver, America's Vancouver in Washington, in, into the Bakken. And, you know, it was at that time when, you know, economy was, was hammered and, you know, there was all of this opportunity. And so my first trip to the Bakken literally reminded me of being in uh, Anchorage as a child, just that level of energy and activity all the time. Uh, I eventually uh, ran an oil field services company then in North Dakota for several years um, and, uh, and then started my consulting role. And it was during that time uh, when I was consulting, I was actually working with some farmers here in northern Montana, <clears throat> about 15 miles south of the Canadian border. And we were talking about developing new supply chain opportunities for them to move uh, their uh, pulse products, peas, beans, lentils into the U.S. West Coast market via rail. And as I was doing a, a farm tour with a, a number of these folks, I happened across my first orphan well. And this image that I have posted behind me is, is one of those that I was first exposed to. And and, you know, what, what was left behind to me was unthinkable in, uh, in kind of in any universe that something like that was okay. You know, I was obviously, you know, brought up that, you know, you clean up your bedroom, you leave things better than the way you find them. Um, you know, you try, to, you try to make things better for the next guy behind you. And I just, I couldn't believe it. And in talking to the farmers, um, you know, who, again, in the U.S., oftentimes the, the mineral rights and the surface rights are a split estate, so they're not always owned by the same folks. And so 
Um, come to find out that th this was a serious problem and certainly in Northern Montana, you know, not only was there the obvious uh, visual impact, uh, but there was also the impact of the surface where it was kind of a sterilization uh, mm -hmm. of the soil just because of the impact of gas and hydrocarbons at the surface. Mm -hmm. And then a, a very noticeable, you know, uh, odor. Uh, coming from the gas emitting from these wells. And many of these wells were literally like open casing. And, and I couldn't get that image out of my mind. And so that night, as I was driving back to Bozeman, about four hours south, I, uh, again, I just, I felt like I was at this inflection point and that, you know, I, I needed to, to, to do something. That's literally where the, uh, the name well done came uh, was during that. And so literally from the time that I left Shelby, Montana um, to returning in Bozeman at about 2 a.m., I had secured domain names for well done. And so, you know, that, that name is so good. You almost had to do something like this. Yeah, <laughs> I, I couldn't believe that it was available. And uh, so anyway, and that's kind of the way that this journey for me has gone, you know, and, and it's been you know, I oftentimes have to, you know, check myself to, you know, see if I'm actually, you know, if I'm, you know, going down the right road and in, on any given day, it can either be a blessing or a curse, of course, you know, and yeah, but, but for me, knowing, it's knowing too much, right. A blessing and a curse. <laughs> exactly. And, and, you know, this problem is so huge across the United States, literally millions of orphan wells. And, you know, it just is so overwhelming. And even just the notion of climate change is overwhelming. And, and, and so we really had to walk that back to sort of these manageable components. And that's where we developed the tagline of one well at a time. And, and it really is about, you know, making a difference. And, and it's more about, for me anyway, it's more about uh, hoping to help to inspire others to do something and not, you know, just something, right? And don't be overwhelmed. Don't feel like, well, they're, you know, insignificant. There's nothing that I can do because I think my story is one that shows that you can do something. And so. Okay, so you mean to tell me you were in the oil industry for most of your career, but you'd never actually seen an oil well, an oil rig? No, no, an, an orphan well. So there's okay. a difference between a well that is producing. So let me, maybe I can, for your viewers, give a little, shed a little detail on uh, what an orphan well is. So uh, an orphan well, by definition, is one that does not have any financially responsible party uh, intact in the chain of custody, if you would. And, and what happens is through progression is you think of, you know, these early discoveries. And remember, we've been at this since 1859. And so, um, you know, many times those early discoveries are, are really driven and financed by a lot of the major oil companies. Um, and then they start to get spun off. So they get sold to a junior player, who then sells them to a, a, a less uh, or player uh, all the way down to, you know, I call it mom and pop oil. And literally that's what happens in this progression because what happens, you know, you'll find that there's a decline in production over time. Okay. And yeah. It, it, think about it, it. makes sense. And so what happens is then those fields and those wells within those fields are referred to as a stripper well. And essentially what it means is that they're very little production. They're really, you know, kind of on the edge of being financially viable. And then of course you throw in any kind of a market turn uh, or an impact to commodity prices. And, you know, oil and gas is, is always measured by what the lifting cost is. So how much does it cost me to produce a barrel of oil? And so in these stripper fields or these, you know, these fields that are right on the edge of, of being financially viable, you know, any impact there can turn the tables and literally create them to be uneconomical. And of course, you know, what happens typically is that those companies go out of business. There is no successor in line. There's no financial incentive for another player to come in and, and buy the liability. So they become wards of the state and that's what's happened over time. And so that's the true definition of an orphan well. And that's really what our focus is, is on orphans only because the story is so 
clear. And how many are there of these orphan wells in this country and how much methane are they leaking? And is that a process that increases or decreases over time? Well, there are literally millions uh, of orphan wells in the United States by any numbers of estimations. Um, you know, I say often in, uh, you know, as I'm speaking with folks that, you know, when I first started down this path in 2019, this was literally everyone's dirty little secret. Uh, every state, nobody wanted to talk about it because it was a black market. You know, the states didn't have any funding uh, to do the work. The wells were out there. They were an eyesore. Some are leaking gas, some are leaking oil, some are leaking, you know, produced water. And, and it's literally, it's a mess. And so nobody wanted to- They're not capped at all, these open wells. Some are, some aren't, you know, I mean, and, and it's a big variation. And so, uh, so as we started going down this path and when I first reached out to the state of Montana and, you know, kudos to them because they really, you know, they, they took a chance, if you would, on the Well Done Foundation. When we approached them with this crazy idea, first of all, they thought we were, you know, uh, the potential to be some radical environmental group that was looking to take them to task. And the reality is, no, we just want to, we just want to do the right thing. And that's been our driver from the get go is let's, we just want to do what's right. Mm -hmm. And so we actually ended up uh, in a cooperative agreement with the state whereby we're paying the state of Montana, figure this out. We pay the state of Montana to assume the responsibility and the financial liability to plug and abandon these wells. So we, we actually step into the shoes then of a bonded operator. And uh, when, so when we adopt a well, uh, it's for keeps, it's like adopting a puppy, you know, you don't get to give it back. Right. And so, um, yeah, so as we started that process, then that created a platform for us to use with the other states then that we're working, that we're working with. And so, you know, it's been a great evolution. Uh, and obviously we've been very active in the media talking about the work we're doing and this orphan well problem. You know, now there's, you know, some funding coming down from the federal government to help with this. You know, we haven't accepted a, a single dollar of taxpayer money. We feel that there's a, a better way of, we think there's a market-based solution. And, uh, and so that's what, uh, that's how we approach it. And, and uh, like I said, we're, uh, we're excited, you know, when Diane first reached out to us with her idea on her birthday campaign, um, you know, we talked about amongst the, with the team and it's like, of course, you know, what a, what a great lady, very excited about what we're doing. And it's a, it's a good opportunity. This is really a grassroots movement, so. Yeah, yeah excited. I, I saw it less than 24 hours ago and I jumped out of my car seat. <laughs> Just like, we, we greenies get so excited when we see a solution that's actually working, you know? And of course, Green TV is all about eco solutions. So this is very exciting. I have several questions for you. Um, first of all, and you're in how many states now? We are actively plugging right now in, in five states. So we have projects going on in Montana. We have projects happening in Louisiana. In fact, I'm just about to take off here this evening and head to uh, our next uh, project we're doing down there in conjunction with Tito's. Little uh, shout out to the folks at Tito's Handmade Vodka who have sponsored a number of wealth with us. So well, I just flew in from Austin and uh know them well they sponsor um something called next tribe women aging boulder uh oh. women aging boldly and yeah somehow i'm <laughs> doing that wonderful <laughs> right well so and, and, it's, and it's been great because we've also you know through um that relationship and just you know being present in austin we've got another family who has just sponsored a well here in montana so, and, and they have their own climate uh, crisis fund. And so, you know, it, it's, it's been fun to see how this work is working, but, you know, we're plugging in Ohio, we're plugging in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania, we're preparing to do some work in New York, we're preparing to do some work in Oklahoma. Uh, and then we're, you know, we've been, we've been uh, monitoring wells in Kansas and we're getting ready to start some work in California. So, 
um, you know, there's there's a lot of opportunity out there. And what's great about this at the end of the day, what I love, because, again, I'm not some scientist or math whiz. But what's awesome is that this is literally gas on gas off. Right. When we're done and we walk away, the gas is no longer emitting. We're able to quantify how much gas that was and uh, and what a great solution. And uh, so I love that. Uh, and in general, are, are these sort of small amounts, but just add up over the years and especially over eternity, if not cap, or are they large amounts? And this is just a travesty that this has been going on, you know, under the radar. Every everything that, that's an entire spectrum, uh, Betsy, some are are emitting fairly, you know, negligible amounts, although it is all to your point, it's all cumulative when you think about two million across the board. Yeah. Some of the wells that we come to, and I could show you some photos that would curl your toes, um, are crazy. I mean, literally ripping gas. I mean, so much so that, you know, we have to take emergency action. We just got finished up with a project in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, plugging a well called the Our Lady of Angels Number One, which was literally located uh, in the courtyard of a retirement uh, apartment complex that was emitting over you know 2,500 cubic feet of methane gas per day. And, um, you know, so when we come on projects like that, they obviously, you know, ratchet up, if you would, in the uh, certainly in the priority uh, case. We work very closely, of course, with the state regulatory agencies. And, you know, that's what's been fun through this journey. And, and by being a, an NGO, you know, we're kind of a trusted resource at that point. We're not, you know, it's not like we're trying to line our pockets or, or you know, we have some skullduggerous uh, you know, uh, uh, approach to doing business is very transparent. What we started a couple of years ago, because we, we could tell that we needed to transition our funding stream from, you know, I call it car washes and bake sales. And I, I mean, I, I say that um, and I mean it you know, very dearly because we've received, you know, a lot of uh, contributions, charitable contributions that help us to do this work. You know, when we first started, everything was being funded, you know, out of my pocket. But we felt that in order to scale this up, to really be able to meet the hundreds of thousands and millions of these need to happen, we needed the solution. So we started a process with the American Carbon Registry to create a, a methodology then that would allow us uh, a way to create carbon credits uh, out of the methane gas that we are obviously eliminating out of the chain. And so we sponsored uh, the first of its kind methodology. It's still in the it's still in the works. It's actually in scientific peer review right now. But very much like the state of Montana, the American Carbon Registry in Winrock took a chance on the Well Done Foundation. They believed in what we were doing, they believed in our mission. And you know, now what that will help to do is to create a platform, obviously for us to work, but for others to join in this fight, because this is way bigger than the Well Done Foundation. But part of our contribution back again is this uh, opportunity uh, through the methodology for others to, to do good work too. And what happens if one of these is, um finished these days, like if, if one of Shell's, you know, rigs um, is shut down, are they in fact doing what they should be doing, which is making sure it's shut down? Are, are some of these wells still under some accountability? And what do you do when you encounter those? And, and are they, you know, being enforced if I would hope there's laws requiring them to, as you say, clean up after themselves? After they leave. Yeah, so there, you know, a good point because uh, absolutely, the there has been a huge um, transition in the the financial assurance component. Uh, this is the regulatory agencies and the and the industry have been working together, and so the likelihood of of this kind of epidemic happening again is, is pretty low just because of the amount of bonding that's being required for the new drills and the activity. And just like anything, it, you know, you think about the evolution of the industry over time. I mean, obviously from the first well drilled in Pennsylvania in 1859, 
to where, you know, we're at now and the, you know, thinking of our friends at, you know, in the Marcellus shale play there, who are really some of the most responsible operators, I think that we've ever, we've ever come across, you know, we're a, a member of the Marcellus shale coalition. And I, I got to tell you that they have been some of our strongest supporters. Um, you know, they understand that there's a social license that the industry has nowadays. Um, and, and they've got to, they have to do the right thing. And, and they have, it's, it's just, we're sort of left with this legacy problem. And that's really where our focus is. Not to mention all the, um, you know, subsidizing of the oil industry. And, you know, like if, if you found some of these and they were owned by Exxon, they certainly have the resources to cap them, which brings me to my question about the cost. What on earth requires $30,000 to cap each of these? Well, you know, I wish that it was just $30,000. We have, you know, that's that's kind of our Montana number. There are our kind of our revised uh, estimate and we work closely with the states, of course, and, and, if, and every well is different. So first of all, you know, um, just because of the surface condition, you know, you see this well behind me in the picture there, it's great. You know, it's out in the prairie of Montana. You can watch your dog run away for a week out there. Um, you know, you get into the Appalachian Basin and, you know, you've got terrain and forest and streams. Um, you know, many of these legacy wells uh, were drilled back in the day when they literally used teams of horses uh, to move the equipment around. Now, the, all of the equipment is bigger and beefier. So oftentimes, you know, access is one of the largest cost components of the work that we do. And so by that, by saying that, we've had wells that have been as much as uh, several hundred thousand dollars. Um, you know, there are wells that can go, you know, depending on the complexity of the project up to, you know, a million dollars. So we use $30,000 as a planning number, but the reality is, is that uh, it can be significantly north of that. It, what we do as part of this work is we, we measure and monitor a well for a significant period of time so that we can definitively show what the methane emission uh, uh, structure is. And, and that's really critical in our ability to be able to tell the story. And as you know, you know, in the world of ESG, um, transparency and accountability is at the, at the cornerstone of making sure that it's and under a lot of scrutiny right now, a hundred percent, you bet. <laughs> as it should be, as it should be. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you're asking people if they're concerned and interested to make a donation. I assume it's tax deductible. You're a foundation. Um, and how, what, what portion of um, your budget comes from individuals versus, uh, let's say, big uh, foundations? Sure. I, I think that's a great question. And the government. Yeah. You said you get some I, government money. We, we actually haven't received a single dollar of taxpayer money, and that's by design. Um, because we feel there's a market-based solution to this. Um, I would say from our charitable budget this year, that accounts for about 30% of the revenue. And, you know, it's a little harder on that uh, charitable side for us to be able to, to plan for, you know, it's kind of the way I've expressed it before, it, you know, with our team and to our board is that's really the reactionary part of our budget because we raise money, we plug wells, right? We raise money, we plug wells. The more money we raise, the more wells we plug. What we're thankful for is we have companies, I mentioned Tito's, we've also just signed a, a new company on in California called New Light Technologies and Air Carbon. And uh, who they are is that they're a company that has developed a unique uh, plastic alternative that is actually um, degradable in uh, in the marine life and and so they started as a company that was really focused on ocean plastics issues. So now that we've teamed up with that company, um, you know, and we have a ten year agreement in place with them to do a significant amount of work, um, you know, that helps us then to to be able to scale up to have a, a budget and a planning tool. And then, of course, as, as you know, carbon credits become approved and we're able to leverage that, then we see that going up. But I got to tell you that the, the charitable contribution component of our work is probably, for me, 
the the most meaningful because it allows people like Diane and her team to get involved in a in a project that has identity. Uh, they can literally go out and get some dirt under their fingernails uh, and and help us in the restoration efforts or help us in some of the measuring and monitoring. So all of a sudden, instead of just writing it check, you know, stroking a check for, you know, to your offset, you actually have some skin in the game and some DNA, if you would. And so for me, those are exciting. Now, they're a lot of work for us, uh, just so you know, uh, because everyone becomes a bit of an event, but it's, it's meaningful, like I said, and that, you know, for me, that's how it started. That's how this journey started was I was touched by what I saw and felt I had to make a difference. And when you get enough money to cap one of these wells, do you go to where the damage is coming out the fastest, the methane is coming out fastest? How do you decide, gee, let's, if there's so many, which ones we go to next? That's a great point. We, uh, we have a, a team of folks that I lead. Um, we refer to ourselves as wildcatters, carbon wildcatters. And uh, what we do is we go out and identify uh, targets, right? The potential subject wells. There's so much work that has to happen before we're able to even step foot on a landowner's property. Um, we've got to do all of our due diligence work. There's, as you can imagine, there's a ton of legal activity that needs to happen to make, uh, you know, get us the, to that point. So what we try to do to your point is we'd like to maintain a, a significant amount of inventory then that we prioritize based on emission levels. And so and it's a balance. Of course, we don't want to be heavily overweighted by so much inventory that, you know, that we can't get the work done. And plus, it's a very, you know, it's a significant financial responsibility for our foundation because every well that we adopt, remember, there's no give backs. So we have, we assume a liability for those wells. Like uh, case in point, we just adopted another 78 wells here in Montana. So that means that we saddled up for about $2.5 million worth of financial responsibility for these wells. And we don't take that lightly. So, but what we do is we're identifying targets all the time. In fact, we just launched on our website now uh, a page for landowners to be able to because I get calls literally every day from folks that see our work and say, hey, I got one of these in my backyard, you know? And so uh, here's an opportunity now for them to take uh, part and, and be a part of our network, if you would. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, as soon as we get a donor or a series of donors like, you know, Diane uh, and her team, then we're identifying wells and starting to pair those up and and, uh, and yeah, so we're excited about that. I'm, in fact, I'll be in Pennsylvania in the next couple of weeks. We've got a well that we're plugging there uh, starting likely next week, but, you know, and then Diane's well will be identifying next for her. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, and uh, we're gonna have Diane on to talk about it after her well that she's adopted is capped. I think she's raised a little over $3,000 towards the yeah. um, 30,000. So we'll see how long that takes. Um, just a couple of quick questions um, to wrap up. Uh, you mentioned Tito's. I know they're based in Austin where I currently live. Uh, are there many wells in Texas that you are capping? I would think that- There's, Yes, there are wells. There are wells all over the place and certainly Texas is, has got their share of them. Um, we're not currently active in Texas, although we're in uh, Louisiana and Oklahoma and starting to look at some projects in New Mexico. Um, we, uh, it's just hasn't been uh, a good fit for us yet to be in Texas. There's every state regulations are a little bit different. So the way that which they handle orphan wells, uh, some run them more like a public works project, if you would. And so um, it's not that we're not planning on being in Texas. It's just that we've been so busy in these other states uh, that uh, we're, we're working our way there. How about and that? Would it be possibly that some of the oil companies based in Texas don't want this to happen? Or is that not the case? I hope it's not the case. No, you know what we found, and, and it, it might have been at the start, by the way, it, you know, people didn't really know how to take us when we first got going. And then, but now it's a different day. I think people understand that we're a trusted resource, that we're, that we're good partners and, and, uh, and we're actually talking with some oil producers there in Texas right now about um, about 
uh, projects like that, you know, what will happen oftentimes is that they'll, they'll acquire acreage. Uh, and with that acreage comes some legacy stuff. And uh, so we're working with them to identify that. Um, but no, we found that the, there's been a huge, um, you know, shift, if, if you would, in the oil and gas industry around, you know, the work that we do, the orphan well piece. Again, we're not competing with that. We're not throwing shade. We're just simply, you know, we just stay focused. For us, this isn't a partisan thing. This isn't whether you're wh whatever end of the climate spectrum you're on from climate denier to climate crusader. I mean, again, this is just the right thing to do. You can't walk out and see one of these wells and think in any universe that, that leaving it like that's all right. And if you know any, if you come across any climate deniers, tell them to tune in to greentv.com. They will be a denier no more if they continue to be as Sean Hannity and some other commentators on uh, Fox and other right wing outlets. Uh, I call them deniosaurs on the wrong <laughs> side of history or fossil fools. So uh, Curtis Shuck, well done. Very, very, very pleased to know about this. Thanks for cooling the earth, uh, the atmosphere, one well at a time. And uh, if we had more time, I'd ask you, you know, how does this offset all the, you know, the fracking and, and the other issues that are releasing methane right now? you know, much, much more quickly than we can keep up with. And we, you want to do, you don't want this to be a token, I know. You don't want to do something only to have it overshadowed by the bad work. I know that people who donate certainly want to know that this is really making a difference. And as far as carbon offset programs go, there are many. This one is truly hands-on and working and quantifiable. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's exciting. Again, you know, we appreciate this opportunity to be with you and your viewers and and look forward to providing you with updates as we're moving projects forward. Terrific. Thanks so much, Curtis. And good luck. We'll chat back with you. And uh, please tell um, all the folks you meet about Green TV. We're growing organically, word of mouth, and virally. A uh, group of very dedicated volunteers, including uh, Christine Weiss, our trusty editor. And uh, we are hoping to go to live streaming soon. And we just need everybody to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That only means, no spam, that you'll be advised when we post an interview like the one we just did. Only solutions. It's um, you know not a, not about problems. It, well, the problems we know. It's about what's being done, what you can do, and uh, how it'll make a difference. Thanks so much. See you next time.